OK, hello, everyone, and good morning. So first, I want to thank you for all for coming here. And this is the second panel of our symposium. And hello, everyone. My name is Si Tongguo, and uh, I'm the assistant professor of sports communication. And this is my second year here at Bradley. So before we talk about some of the important questions about college collegiate sports, please uh, allow me to introduce the, our four panelists first. So our first the panelist, Dr. Joshua uh, Dickhouse, many of you may be familiar with him. He is the acting chair and professor of communication and the director of Charlie Stanner School of Sports Communication at Broadley University. He earned his uh, bachelor degree and also his master degree from Miami University. And he spent two years lecturing at uh, Penn State University before entering the mass communication doctor program at the University of Alabama, where he earned his PhD in 2021. And just uh, main research interests include uh, race in sports, apology rhetoric in sports, and also image restoration in sports. Everyone, please welcome uh, Dr. Rikhaus <laughs> Our second panelist, Dr. Kenan A. Brown, is a professor in the Department of Advertising and Public Relations at the University of Alabama. He is also the director for the Institute for Communication and Information Research and also co-editor for the Beyond Sports Initiative. His research interests include image and reputation management, particularly in sports, and also minority recruitment in mass communication. During his academic career, he has worked uh, and with several sports and uh, entertainment organization, including the International Olympic Committee, Fox Sports, Twitch, NASCAR, and the Country Music Association, especially assisting with the strategic planning and diversity and inclusion initiatives. Mm -hmm. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Brown. Come to our <laughs> <room>. <laughs> Our third panelist, uh, Ms. Jenna Blyce, is the Deputy Director of Athletics and Senior Women Administrator at Northwestern University. She leads and manages five departments for the Wildcats, compliance, academic surveys, and student development, sports medicine, sport performance, and also David G. Uh, Kevlar New for Life program. She serves as the department liaison at the Big Ten and the NCAA meetings. And also, she earned her undergraduate degree in sports medicine and athletic training in 1993 from the University of Connecticut, and also completed his master's degree in sports management from Connecticut, where she played softball. And she was named a Big East Player of the Year three times in her career. Everyone, please welcome Mr. <laughs> Brian Spencer. And our last panelist, many of you are also familiar with, Dr. Paul Galfer. Uh, he is the Henry Means uh, Pindle uh, Indoor Chair and the Professor of Sports Communication at Broadley University. He is also Broadley NCAA Faculty Athletic Representative. He earned the uh, Bachelor Degree in Broadcasting and also Master in Broadcast Management and Programming from Indiana State University. He earned a PhD in communication from the University of Missouri. His research interests are in broadcast history and programming, including uh, especially sports programming. And everyone, welcome our last <laughs> panelist. Come to our <laughs> So the topic for our panel is the changing college sports landscape, which is a very interesting topic. And in this panel, we will mainly focus on three topics, NIF rolling and transfer portal, and also conference realignment. So first, I would like to ask some of the questions for our panelists. So after the answer to the question, if you have any question, we are totally open. And you can just raise your hand and ask questions whenever you like. And we will also leave about 15 minutes at the end of this meeting for you to ask the question that you want to ask. So our first focus is NIL ruling. So for those who are not very familiar with this rule, NIL actually refers to name, image, and likeness. So for a long time, student athletes at NCAA are not allowed to use their name and image to make or for the promotion 
in the commercial area. So in 2021, the NCAA published an interim policy which allowed athletes to profit from the use of their own name, image, and likeness. So this is a really big change in collegiate sport. And because our panelist has worked in different colleges, I think you have all have a lot of experiences looking at this policy and how that changed the uh, landscape of our college sports. So my first question is, how do you see this policy change the college sports landscape since it was published in 2021? And Dr. Dickhouse would like to start first. Sure, I'll start. Um, and I'll, I'll keep it as brief as, as I can, because uh, that question alone could probably take up the whole hour. Um, name, image, and likeness has changed, the, first of all, college recruiting uh, forever. Um, if you want a, a prime example of how this is altered, uh, there are multiple of us here that have Alabama ties that are here. If you watched the University of Alabama play football last year, they had a, they had a fine season and made the college football playoff. But their starting quarterback probably should have been Arch Manning. But he went to Texas to be the backup quarterback because he makes more money in NIL mm -hmm. there than he was going to make at Alabama. That is a thought process that has never went through the head of a college athlete prior to that. Um, so now when, when coaches are going to recruit athletes, the conversation often centers largely around how much money can I get in NIL, okay? Do not get me wrong. Overall, I'm happy for the players that have it. If, if you look at Shador Sanders made over $4 million at Colorado last year. Caitlin Clark's making three and a half million dollars at Iowa this year, uh, which is especially impressive considering her first contract with the WNBA is likely to pay her less than $80,000 a year, okay? But it has changed the complete strategy. If you want a great example, since the end of the college football season, Ohio State has paid out over $10 million in IL deals to get players from Georgia and Alabama to leave their universities and go to Ohio State, okay? So I'll leave that and uh, Dr. Brown can take from there. Absolutely, all right. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna kind of talk about this on the player side of things. And really what it's done is kind of, I mean, honestly, it's kind of even the playing field a little bit. I mean, when you look at particularly in your revenue sports, you talk about football and you talk about men's basketball to a certain extent. Um, coaches have been making tons of money off of collegiate sports. Administrators have been making tons of money off collegiate sports. Networks have been making tons of money off collegiate sports. Brands, you know, in terms of sponsorship. The only people that really weren't, you know, dipping their hand in the pot financially were the athletes, were the students. So what NIL has done is put some of that power back into um, in, into the athlete's hands. It's given them a chance to actually, you know, make money off of their names, off their images, off their likeness. Um, and it's giving them an opportunity to, you know, like promote themselves, promote their personal brand and increase their value before they even step foot in a, you know, on a professional court. And for some of these players, and I really think in terms of women's athletics is where um, you're seeing a big benefit here that you really haven't seen before. Because, I mean, when you talk, again, when you talk about revenue generating sports, softball is probably, I'd say softball and women's basketball are probably the only two, and they're not really considered revenue generating sports by the NCAA, softball might be now. Um, but they are probably, you know, they probably were the two largest sports uh, when it comes to women's athletics. And again, they still kind of paled in comparison to the money that was generated, you know, from football, you know, for example. So having women athletes being able to make money now off their name, off their image, off their likeness, and be able to put some money back in their pockets, it's really helped just kind of amplify women's sports. I mean, I think that NIL, um, I would say that the progress that you've seen in women's basketball really is a direct result of NIL. When you talk about Angel Reese, you talk about Caitlin Clark, you, think, you talk about the spotlight that is on women's basketball right now, where it's bigger than it even was in the 90s when you had Summit and you know, Gina Ariama going go at it in a robbery. I think that that is a positive byproduct of NIL. I, I have a really perhaps <clears throat> different take. 
Um, but I, I think where this would be really helpful is to kind of go back a little bit to the beginning of where NIL started and the difference between what name image likeness means and what the collectives have brought to the table. So I, I want to try to not confuse anyone. I'm trying to separate the two because um, the first two panelists have talked a little bit in, in intertwined name image likeness and collectives and kind of how the real big dollars are being handed out to some of these student athletes. So let me start back with what name image and likeness was intended to do. Um, it, it was intended to allow every student athlete on every campus to act and be more like a student on campus, which means there was no, there's no um, uh, regulation against students on campus to uh, be a musician and sell their music or be an author and sell their book and use their name, image, and likeness to do so. And there was a restriction on student athletes where the feeling was you can't use your prowess as a student athlete, so at Northwestern, wearing your purple and with a big N on the front of it and being able to sell your music or your books and using that to be able to do it. So now the, the changes around name, image, and likeness allowed for that to happen. That's 100%, I mean, too long. That took too long to happen. Should have happened ages and ages ago for that opportunity. But what happens in a really competitive field and in a competitive industry is that when you open the door, people kind of kick it down and develop opportunities with, that, with, with now the legislation opening up, what does that mean? And that's where collectives came into play. And so that's when you hear Dr. Dickhouse talk mm -hmm. about a particular player choosing Texas, I think you said, Texas. over Alabama, and the opportunity to make money at Texas. That wasn't necessarily about name, image, likeness. That's about a recruiting inducement that a college campus is now not being held accountable for in allowing the collectives, which is a group of individuals who can donate third party outside of the athletics department, donate to a particular fund, and those dollars can then be given as a recruiting inducement to get that student to leave Alabama and to go to Texas. And that's the kind of dollars that they can see and be promised. That's not really name image likeness because you don't, that individual, some of those individuals going to, in that, exact, in that example, um, haven't really had the opportunity to promote themselves in a way that developed their brand, but they're being told if you come to this institution, we're going to give you this money, and it's under the guise of name, image, and likeness. And they would be able to make an awful lot of money while they're there, um, just by the, um, the, the opportunity for them to be seen and promoted in particular ways. They'll be able to make those dollars, but I just don't want to confuse the two, because they're, I think, very separate, but have been combined very quickly because one, the changes in, in, in the legislation around name, image, likeness allowed for these collectives to pop up. And that is my, my opinion, the real problem with the issue is the dollar amounts that are associated with recruiting inducements are completely ridiculous. I know I'm on YouTube right now, but I'm saying it. Like completely ridiculous and shouldn't really be allowed to happen. If someone wants to make money off of who they are and their brand and they've worked for it, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. But what's changed the landscape of college athletics are the recruiting inducements that are happening now and the illegal recruiting and tampering that's going on to allow for these changes to happen. I could talk for another 30 minutes, but I'm gonna pass now. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wish you would talk. I, I'm so glad that Jan is on this panel because she's the one panelist up here who deals with this daily and hourly, actually, yeah. seven days a week. The other three of us, we kind of have the luxury of, of observing this from a distance, and we read about it, we write about it, we teach about it, but we're not on the front line of this. Um, with, with NIL, I mean, this was, this was forced upon colleges and universities by the courts. The courts ruled that, and there's a certain philosophical argument to be made for that. I mean, if you don't own your name, your image, and your likeness, what do you own? I mean, of course you own that. And so the courts made that rule, and it, you know, it's not something the NCAA wanted to do. But with every rule, there's an unintended consequence, right? And I think that's kind of what Janet's speaking to here is that it was not supposed to be a recruiting inducement. Um, the NCAA wrote it as such that this is not supposed to be a recruiting inducement, but I've never been a fan of rules that can't be enforced. 
and they've had trouble enforcing it. Now, recently, they've tried. They went <laughs> after Florida State, and more recently, they're, they're after the universities of Tennessee and Virginia. But Tennessee, uh, they, they filed. Uh, they, they filed in court, and right now, there is an injunction that allows, for the time being, until court rules on this, you can use NIL money <coughs> as a recruiting inducement. And a lot of schools are doing it. Uh, they're making a lot of promises. Uh, a, a couple of areas that, you know, I, that haven't been touched on by, by my colleagues, uh, one of them has to do with retention of student athletes and the impact that that's already starting to have on the professional leagues. So, you know, it's one thing to use this type of money to lure student athletes to your campus, but once you get them there, you want to keep them there. And Dr. Dickhouse mentioned Ohio State University a second ago, and that's a, that's a prime example. Last year, Ohio State, they had <coughs> four or five players who were sure first round picks in the NFL. And they're all coming back. They're going back to Ohio State. So in some instances, we've now reached a point where these student athletes can make more money staying in college than they can go into the NBA or the NFL. So it, it delays their entry. It's gonna affect the draft, and arguably it already has. So again, a lot of, un what, what seemed like a good idea at the time has had a lot of unintended consequences. Can I make one a comment on that? I'm, I might say that a lot. I apologize okay. in advance. Um, I am I'm hopeful that change will come and that we will have um, um, a bit of a more level playing field and in some cases perhaps an artificial salary cap when and I think in the next six to 12 months the collectives will be asked to come in-house like you'll be able to bring it in-house to your athletics department and what that's going to afford all of us is to make sure that Title IX law is, in, is impacting what we're giving to our student athletes. So you might have some type of artificial salary cap happen in that scenario because if what you're supposed to be doing under Title IX law is creating equitable opportunities for your men and your women and providing those same types of resources and opportunities, then you wouldn't be able to give a million dollars to the football program and not think about what kind of dollars you're going to give to the women. So that might not be the, what a lot of the donors to the collectives want to see and or hear, but I am going to keep my fingers crossed and be hopeful that that is in fact what happens, that when we bring collectives internal to an athletics department, they now fall under and have to pay attention to Title IX law, and I think we'll find some equity happening that will make me very happy. Sure, as our panelist has already talked about, there are a lot of change of athletes because of this rule. And one question I want to ask next is, so actually the player will change their university because the university and also the state have different laws for this policy across the United States. So when the students would like to go to a university and they find out maybe the end of rule is not that, that perfect for them, so they will choose another university. So what are the th reasons do you think or the challenges, concern people usually have to make a different state have a different law? And even though many people argue that the federal should publish a, a common or a uniform rule to regulate the, all the college sport in the United States, but until now there is no such a rule passed in the United States. So what are the challenges and the concern people usually have before they really establish uh, one rule for this policy. I would love to hear your thoughts mm. on that first. If we, <laughs> I have well, lots of thoughts. If we, yeah. really want, if we really care about the student athletes, we will change this and Congress will, will step in and help us do so. With four, with, with, there's probably 40 different state laws at this time across the country that are regulating the name image likeness space because we can't do it any other way and because in, in until Congress allows us to make some changes, blanket changes across the states, this, our student athletes coming into our institutions will truly not be fully aware of what can happen for them and um, what it means for them going from one state to another. So the injunction that you um, heard Paul speak about, he is, is absolutely correct in that currently the NCAA cannot enforce recruiting inducements 
Uh, they cannot investigate. They cannot hold anyone's feet to the fire while this injunction is in play. And yet what we still don't know is exactly what the, what the, um, uh, the judge, what was his intention behind it. And that's what we're trying to find. And when I say we, I mean the NCAA. And just a side note, I sit on the NCAA Division I Board of Directors. And before that, I was on the Transformation Committee. Some of you may recognize those names. I'm happy to talk more about it another time. But the Transformation Committee led to my time on and the Division I Board of Directors. And currently, the Division I Board of Directors is working with that particular judge, so the lawyers within the NCAA, working with that judge to find out what his intention is. What is his intention? Part of what we have to have is a, and you've probably heard about this as well, but a, 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 like a clearinghouse, an understanding of what exactly is going on, an opportunity for the students out there who are receiving, do you have, I, I'm very careful in calling them students. I just wanna point that out because I, I believe that this is grounded in higher education. So there's students, you're never gonna hear me call, call them athletes. Yes. So student athletes, I'll call them that, but students mostly, most of the time. Um, what, what exactly can they expect? And what's true and what's not true? So we heard $4 million, $3.5 million. I don't, we don't even know if that's true. So it gives us the opportunity to have a clearinghouse, a, de, a place where they can deposit this information. No names have to be attached. But what's real and what's not real is really, really important in this conversation. And if we really care about our student athletes and their experiences and what they should know they're getting, that I think is what that injunction is trying to get at. But currently it's, it's not. And if I uh, I'll throw in there real fast, one of my backgrounds in teaching here at Bradley has been com law and ethics. Um, one of the things I've learned about the law is it's extremely interpretive. Okay, and so what I call NIL from a legal perspective was best laid plans. That it was, in theory, it was the right idea. But in practice and in interpretation, it's extreme, it can be manipulated a lot. And it's being manipulated a lot. Um, and that's what's turned what in theory was a very good idea into something that is being practiced extremely poorly right now. So Paul, I didn't mean to go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, good. No, I, I just wanted to follow up on something I said earlier about inducements. I think this is a really interesting argument in terms of recruiting inducements because you should be aware there's another side to this. There are a lot of people that think, why shouldn't this be used as an inducement? If a university has a lot of money through their collective, <clears throat> why can't they? The, the concern of the NCAA is to it creates a competitive imbalance. Mm -hmm. There has never been balance competitively in college sports, and there isn't now. So every university uses what resource it has to recruit student athletes. Some recruit based on great educations. Some recruit based on facilities. Some show off their outstanding coaches. So for those who would argue it should be used as an inducement, this is just one more tool in the toolbox of recruiting. And what's wrong with that? And you know, it's, it's not always necessarily easy to tell what constitutes inducement. Because every coach I talk to says when they recruit a student athlete, they have to talk about NIL. Because that student athlete is gonna ask about it. Every one of them does. So at what point is that informational versus a pitch or a, an inducement? And it's, it's not that easy to determine when you think about it uh, because they all have to talk about it at some level. Um, I mean, the only point I want to make um, with this is just kind of why the government has to step in. And I honestly think, it, in my personal opinion, I think it's because the NCAA just really hasn't done a great job of regulating NIL and collectives. And they don't really have the enforcement power, as you're seeing with the cases with Tennessee and Miami. Uh, to, you know, in particular, I feel like they don't have the enforcement power to, to regulate this thing, to actually like enforce the guidelines that they have put in place. Um, so the reason that it, NIL is you know, considered the Wild West right now is because the governing body that should be regulating this and actually you know, keeping it in check really doesn't have the power that 
you know, a lot of people assume they do. And that's, that, you know, they were losing that power before NIL. I mean, they were losing that power. The NCAA was losing that power uh, when you look at, you know, sanctions when it came to, like, academic fraud in the North Carolina case and things like that. So, you know, this isn't new. It's just one of those things where NIL, I think, has really exposed the issues and the holes in the NCAA and its governing power um, they were already there. It's just they're, they're more visible. They're more out in the open now because NIL has just become this just monster of a you know of a, of a thing. Yeah, there are a lot of concern with the NFL ruling and the similar things that happens for another part, which is the transfer portal. So the NCAA transfer portal actually is an application database and compliance tool actually launched in 2018 to manage and facilitate the process for student athletes to seek to transfer between their member institution. So put that in simple word, if you want to transfer to another university, you can just let your school know and the school will put your name in the database and you desire school will try to reach out to you and make a contact with you to try to move forward. And many people consider this is a really positive policy because it just increased the transparency, uh, transparency for the student if they want to make a transfer between the institution. So based on your experiences, how do you think that the NCAA transfer portal affect collegiate sports since 2018? Any specific improvements or challenges you have already seen throughout these years? I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by saying, I, I, this is another example of something I think that sounded really good in theory, um, that, you know, how often do coaches leave, right? Coaches leave, take a new job, they don't have to sit out a year when they leave. Um, why should players be punished if they want to go to a different school? Okay, they shouldn't have to sit out a year, lose a year of eligibility. It sounded really good. But then when you see it in practice, it's extremely messy. Okay, Lincoln Riley leaves Oklahoma. What's he take with him as quarterback? Who doesn't have to sit out a year? What's he do? He, go win, he goes and wins the Heisman at USC. Okay, and Oklahoma who's also made the investment in that athlete is left without a quarterback, okay? Now it is true that a large portion of college athletes go to play a particular sport at a particular school because they want to play for a particular coach, okay? We're obviously worried about that at Alabama right now since St. Nick retired, okay? That's what you call him, it's St. Nick, all right? That's a problem. We know how many players went to school there because they wanted to play for St. Nick Saban, okay? However, suddenly what Nick Saban even talked about, and I'm going to quote him here, was that he would sit down in a recruit's living room. They're in high school and say, okay, if I sign for out with Alabama, if I don't get to play this much, I'm leaving. And I'm leaving right away. Okay? That's suddenly an expectation of an incoming first-year player is that they should start over a junior or a senior who at that point is a better player than them. Okay? And I'm going to say this before it moves on. I call the transfer portal the Khalil Mack rule. This is where it started. Khalil Mack is one of the greatest college football players ever. He's a, most likely a Hall of Fame football player. He's in the NFL right now. He got missed during the recruiting process. And he ended up at the University of Buffalo. And coaches at big schools said, well, you know what? Players should be able to transfer. And coaches at smaller schools, most notably the University of Buffalo, said, no, you're trying to pill for our good players for your teams. Unintended consequences, which Paul brought up with NIL. Unintended consequences, big name schools are losing their players. They are transferring if they don't think they're getting enough playing time and they're doing it right away. We have seen entire college basketball teams enter the transfer portal, the entire team, okay? That was not what the transfer portal, transfer portal was intended to do. Yeah, I tend to think that we, we overestimate the impact of NIL on college sports. And I believe that we tend to underestimate the impact of the transfer portal on collegiate sports. And, and that's not saying that NIL isn't a, big, it isn't a big deal. I mean, it is. It's a big deal. It needs to be reined in. But the, the transfer portal has dramatically changed the landscape. And I mean, it should be something that, okay, should be something that evens the playing field a little bit. But I mean, it really hasn't. What I think it's done is I honestly think it's just made the rich richer is really what's happening. And I think it goes back to what you were saying about, all right, now you're poaching players from other, you know, from, um, 
you know, smaller schools to come to larger schools. But also, I mean, I point to Ole Miss as a great example of this. Um, you don't have to be great at recruiting anymore. I honestly, like, I, I don't think you have to be great at recruiting anymore. If you can be good at playing the game of the transfer portal, kind of like Ole Miss football did this year, I, I honestly <laughs> think that they are going to be in contention for a national title this year because of the talent that they have brought in through the transfer portal. Not recruiting, but through the transfer portal. Um, I mean, you can build, you know, these ready-made one-year teams that will just make a run for it all. And honestly, I think it's also going to be kind of the downfall of the dynasties. Like, I honestly think that Nick Saban's uh, dynasty is probably the last true dynasty that you're going to see in, um, sorry, in uh, college football. Um, I don't think college basketball has been as effective because you already had the one and done rule. So you really had a lot of players already that kind of came in for one year and then they jumped to the league, uh, particularly with men's college basketball. So I don't think it's affecting it as much, but you are seeing entire teams, you know, jump into the transfer portal. Um, so, I mean, I think that parity is always going to be there, but yeah, I mean, I think that especially with football, I mean, I think you're seeing that experience where they can build these for a term that I, I always hate using super teams that can just take a run for a year at a, at a title and then, you know, half the team can jump ship. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I, I do think that we underestimate just <clears throat> how much the transfer portal is, you know, ch is changing and will change uh, college sports over the next few years. Um, I feel like the historian, I want to go back for a second mm -hmm. and explain that this is the transfer portal is uh, kind of a phenomenon right now, and also it's really only different for men's and women's basketball, football, and ice hockey. Those are the sports that could not transfer without having to sit out a year at the institution that they're transferring. Prior to that, I mean, any, any other sport could transfer. They didn't have to sit out a year, and you didn't really hear about it much at all. Um, the portal now creates this, first of all, it's a, it's a place where you can just put your name and you don't have to do like all, you don't have to be the one that's going out and trying to find the, the opportunities any longer. The coaches are going into the portal and trying to figure out what it is, like if, if you fit their system, if that's what you're looking for and they can reach out to you. So it's, it's condensed and it's in one place and that's been really helpful for the student athletes. So that I understand. Um, but this is not new. Transferring, the opportunity to transfer is not new for the majority of our sports. Football, basketball, hockey, you had to sit out a year when you transferred. And the reason for that, if you like it, you don't have to like it, um, is because the experience of the student athlete, again, grounded in academics, grounded in higher education. And those are the sports that there was some concern over how often those student athletes were graduating. And so the idea is if you're gonna transfer to another institution, you're going to sit one year at that institution and you're gonna make sure that your academics is exactly where it needs to be. That you've transferred enough credits, that you're on track, you've met your progress towards degree, you've picked a major that you, are, you know, wanna do, that it matters to you, and that's why there was a one year process. Now, what you hear about now is, it's just, well, this transfer portal is just a free for all. And it is. Because no longer individuals are taking the time to think about their move, but they just got sideways with the coach one day. They just didn't quite like how practice was set up. They didn't like that their social media accounts weren't being overrun with what they thought they should be. What? A anything like that. And then they can look at the coach and say, you know, I'm going to go into the transfer portal. This isn't for me. What has changed now, you can imagine, Coach, this is an incredibly hard job as a men's and women's basketball. Let me just start with men's and women's basketball coach, particularly at the Division I level. And I would say in mid-major here at Bradley, you're lucky if you're going to hang on to your best player for two years. And they're going to have people in their ears, and they're going to say, you know what, Bradley's not the right place for you. You should go into the transfer portal because I bet you'll find a better opportunity. Well, how does anyone know what the better opportunity is? That needs to be made individually, student by student. And what they're not taking into account is when they transfer and their classes don't transfer with them, or they don't have a major to be able to tr transfer into, or they're now taking a general studies major, which really meant nothing to them to begin with. And, and all they've got in their mind is, well, I just want to play. Where can I go and play and get the most eyeballs on my social media account, but I'm not really concerned about what it's going to look like when I graduate with that degree, whatever that degree looks like, and where I'm going to go. 
So the transfer portal has given people to the opportunity to transfer whenever they want to whatever school they want. And as long as that in, intaking institution finds a major for them, that those classes transfer and they're meeting progress towards degree, great, they think great. And certainly at Northwestern, I can tell you that's not the way that it operates. At a top 10 academic institution with only 83 majors, it's a difficult scenario to be able to bring individuals in and figure out what major is going to work for them. And certainly not someone who wants to transfer to three, four times to do it. Um, coaches don't know how to hold kids accountable any longer, and it's a real issue. So they want to hold them accountable. If you're not coming to practice, you're showing up five times late for practice, I want to hold you accountable. And I'm not sure if I can hold you accountable because you're my best player, and I don't want to upset you because you might go into the transfer portal, and my job is sort of tied to you. I need to win. So it's creating chaos in a lot of different spaces. Um, and I will, the last thing I'd like to say is it's really creating a problem for high school students wanting to come into college on an athletic scholarship. First year students are not being recruited at the same rate that they have in the past because coaches are hanging on. If they have four scholarships, maybe they'll recruit two first years. And maybe they'll hang on to the other two because they want to play in the transfer portal because they're always looking for a more mature student athlete. And by that, I just mean athletically to come into their program and make an impact and help them win some games. Um, I get it because I work it, it's a business. I understand it and I work in it and also I don't have to love it. And I'm really very concerned about what students, this decision students are making to jump into the transfer portal without all of the information about what it's gonna do to them academically. Yeah, the um the amazing thing, about, it's really hard to talk about the portal without also in tandem speaking to NIL because the two are entwined often. Mm -hmm. I mean, students will transfer for more playing time, but let's be honest, they're not transferring so that they can get a better academic program. Yeah. They're transferring for the money. And so uh, those two kind of run in tandem. And I, I approach this, my job is to teach. so. If, this is, if there's going to be an educational mission to intercollegiate athletics, if the student comes first and the student athlete, I absolutely hate the lessons that the transfer portal is teaching. It's teaching, don't worry about commitment. There doesn't need to be any loyalty. When things get rough, leave. I mean, these are terrible lessons to teach young people. But I fear that's what the portal teaches. And so I, I, I don't like what student athletes learn by participating in the transfer portal. I will say if there's one positive to the transfer portal, it might be that there's finally some parity in intercollegiate athletics that didn't exist prior. Uh, I think it's probably most pronounced in men's basketball where you know if, if you've tried to pick your March Madness brackets, like I have, <laughs> God help us. I mean, there's, there's 25 teams that could win the national championship, right? There's not any yep. single dominant club that you would say, this team's a lock. Mm -hmm. um, think of the final four last year. You had who, San Diego State and Florida Atlantic. I mean, mm -hmm. who would have predicted that, right? Yep. I, yep. And, and same thing, oh, you, you got you your did, bracket you right. <laughs> Um, see me afterwards and help me with mine, would you? Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and the college football playoff last year, I mean, you did not have Georgia, you didn't have Ohio State, and you didn't have Clemson. When's the last time that happened? So suddenly, yeah, so now you've got TCU in there and you know, Texas, Washington. I, in, in a sense, it does kind of level that playing field, but honestly, that's about the only positive consequence I can think of this. I'd love to say one more thing about Transfer Portal because we're not w wonderfully successful with the Transfer Portal, mm -hmm. meaning 60% 60, 60 of the students that enter the Transfer Portal find a home with a scholarship on the other side of it. And last time I checked, that's a D minus. Yep. That's yep. not great. 60%. Yeah. So what has, what's going on with, all the, with the other 40%? Now, I'm not telling you that the other 40% all had full athletic scholarships and they're diving into the portal and they're not finding any place to go. I mean, that's, that may not be the case. Maybe they were walk-ons and they were just trying to find another opportunity that could get them more playing time. But I'm telling you, 60% success rate is not good. 
and you don't hear about the student athletes that go into that portal and don't find on the other side what they're wanting, what they're looking for, what they're hoping for. Mm -hmm. But the enticement of like, go into the portal, find something better. Someone else is out, like there's another person that'll treat you better. There's another school that will care more about you. I don't, we don't, people don't talk about that. 60% is a D. And that school doesn't have to take them back. No. So they may not even find a landing spot, which means they're not gonna get a college degree at all. I say it's the grass is greener mm -hmm. somewhere else. And it, it, it prevents, it's not just loyalty to me. It, if you want something in life, you usually have to work for it. And success is earned, not given. And there are some great players we've seen, whether they're in Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA, whatever, who started as backups. And they work their way. I mean, I'll just pick one example. That, you know, Brett Favre is a legendary quarterback. When he started as a quarterback at Southern Miss, he was seventh string. He was seventh string as a freshman at, at Southern Miss. Okay? And he had to work for it. There wasn't a, I can just transfer and this team will start me a solution, right? And then, you know, it started to sort of fall with the, the grad transfer. You know, you get that one extra year, and then you get a guy that Notre Dame goes out and gets Sam Hartman, who's been in college for 18 years, it feels like, yes. and manages to get another year of eligibility to be a, a, a quarterback. I think our panelist raised a very interesting question about the loyalty, and we talk, uh, and we talk about student population. I think one of the reasons why they have the transfer portal is influenced by the professional sports league because there are some free agency in the professional sports league that they can make their own choice. People say you should be stay loyalty with your team. However, professional athletes now seems like get more freedom compared with that. So many people compare the transfer portal with free agency. So what are our panelists to think of the difference and similarities when we compare these two policies here? Paul, you yeah. yeah. The, no, the, the difference is when you're a professional athlete, what you do is you play ball. When you're a college athlete, you have to go to class. You have to study, and it's, it is not easy to be a collegiate athlete. It's a lot of hard work, and so that, to me, is fundamentally the difference at all. She's got a lot to say. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Say all right. Oh, no. yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. Um, <laughs> I mean, I pretty much agree with, you, with what you said. I mean, I think that the, the complexity of it is the academic side of it. Um, you know, when people are making that comparison to, you know, free agency and professional sports, they're not really taking into account all the complexities of finding a major, making sure the classes fit, um, you know, dealing with scholarships and things like that. So, I mean, I, I think it's almost an unfair comparison of the two, just because you don't have all the nuances and all the complexities um, in professional sports that you do have in college sports. So I mean, that was pretty much going to be my answer, so I'll, I'll <laughs> throw it to you. I'll, I'll go, I, should, I, should, no, I, I see why people say it, I, because, and I'm not trying to, to beat on Ohio State here, even though I don't care for them. <laughs> uh, but like, the, it, you can look at it, as Paul said, you know, they have four or five guys who could have went in the draft and suddenly they're going back. Well, they're not going back for free, right. okay? They're not. And so I get what you mean as well, it's a free agency. I, I, I get it. Um, but we are also talking about the few. This is not something that's happening to the majority or the vast majority of of college athletes and you know Janet brought up Title IX I'm actually shocked in, in NIL trend I mean the Title IX equity of this has been lost uh, almost completely um, but I get that there are certain there are certain universities in certain sports that get more attention for this and it certainly makes it look like as soon as like the college football season ends then the free agency period starts and that is how it felt this year I mean, a little bit. Like, the University of Georgia lost 32 players off their football team. 32. Some are going to the NFL early. Many of them are transferring to a different school. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. Don't cry in your beer for Georgia because they're just going to reload Hello. with <laughs> their own. And they're, believe me, they're out there taking their own players from other people. I get why they're saying it, but I do think it focuses more on the few 
and not the many, that the majority of your college athletes don't <coughs> get, ever get to enter this quote unquote free agency period. Yeah, I, I, just want our, I just want our student athletes to have all the information. I want them to know what they're doing. I, want, I, I would love them to be prioritizing their academics and their desire to get a degree that will help them in their futures. So not just any degree, but what is it that you really want to do with it? Um, and I also truly believe that our student athletes should be treated as similar to students on campus as possible in every way, shape, or form. And so where a student on campus can transfer whenever they may like for whatever reason, I understand that so should a student athlete. They just can't, you can't sort of have the conversation with the really high level profile sports in the transfer portal without speaking to name image likeness and whether or not they're going into the portal because they're seeking something like a quick fix to something or whether it is actually best for their long term academic career, professional career, all of that because sports are only going to be there for a certain period of time. And it can teach you all of the most amazing, wonderful lessons, which is why I'm in this business. And you don't want to lose that, but you also have to understand that it's getting you prepared for the rest of your life, and it's likely not going to be there for the rest of your life. Yeah, to, you know, to that point, and to Dr. Dickhouse's point, I mean, that's the sadness of a lot of this, is that in a lot of cases, maybe even probably the majority of the cases, the student athlete model of amateurism works pretty well. I mean, what gets the press is, frankly, the Power Five football programs, and you know, and that's what gets the attention. You don't see the story about the Division Three athlete mm -hmm. who's having a solid experience, and yet. I, Last I saw, something like 40% of the schools out there that are playing sports are Division III. But you'd, you'd never hear about those. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's, it's a shame that it's really a relative minority that are making headlines and kind of poisoning collegiate athletics for everybody else. And we have already talked a lot of the player transfer from different school. And if we look at the bigger picture, actually, we can look at the conference also changed a lot in the last few years, mm -hmm. especially beginning the 2021 to 24 academic, uh, 22 academic year. There are a lot of changes happening about the leagues. Maybe the most obvious one is Pac-12 conference. Actually, now currently, there are 10 out of the 12 teams are actually leave for other conference. And also the most recent example, I think if you pay attention to sports news at the end of last year, so the committee led the University of Alabama instead of the Florida State to make to the playoff for the football last year. So Florida State actually became the first undefeated Power Five champion to miss the college football playoffs. And that caused a lot of discussion about the conference realignment in the last few years. So I just want to ask some questions about that part. How do you think this uh, team, why are the reasons that the team's moving a lot and the conference actually also changed a lot in the last few years? I, I have thoughts, can I take this first? Money, I mean we know this, money. I, the, the whole, this whole thing is happening because of money. Anybody that tells you any different, anybody that tells you that it's for another reason is full of it. Like the reason that the, yeah, football, specifically football money. This is what, that, that is really what's driving this. And the reason that I'm very like passionate about this because I really do think, um, and it might happen sooner than later, but at some point these large football powerhouses, your Alabama's, your Ohio State's, your USC's, um, they're gonna get together at some point and say, you know what, we really don't need the NCAA. We don't. I mean, we don't need the NCAA. Like we are, our college football playoff is already outside of the NCAA in the first place. Do we really need the NCAA to tell us what we can and cannot do? And they're probably just going to split at some point. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm probably being like way over dramatic with this, but I feel like the I feel like the tea leaves are there. I mean, I feel like at some point you're going to get these big name schools that are just going to get together and they're going to they're going to bring a few like academically focused. They're going to bring like your North Carolinas, your Northwesterns, um, your Stanford's, you know, and and include them as well because they want to at least pretend like they care about academics. And what they're going to do is they're going to make this you know 60, 64, you know, however many team 
just you know a level above the NCAA and just say, all right, screw it, we're we're out. Um, because I really do think with what is happening now with the Big Ten and SEC, we're like we're marching towards that. I mean, there's no reason why. I think we were talking about this last night, Paul. I mean, there's no reason why a school that a softball team at Rutgers should have to actually, or a tennis team from Rucker has to fly to, you know, halfway across the country for a Wednesday night game because these teams are so concerned about football revenue. It makes no sense. Like, it makes no sense. But I understand why they're doing it. But again, if they, if they tell you it's for anything other than money, it's a lot. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Either one of you two. I'm not going to disagree. It is about money. Um, and I will say football at the, at the collegiate level is built on a house of cards. Uh, we saw that during COVID when we couldn't bring in any type of revenue around our football programs, even when we in the Big Ten chose to have a, a season, but there weren't any fans in the stands. There was no concessions to be sold. There were no parking fees to collect. Um, it was re it, it became very eye-opening, although you knew it already, it became very eye-opening to understand just how impactful revenue is on the football side to be able to manage the rest of your athletics department. So why I will say, yes, it's about money. And I sit in our joint group meetings in the Big Ten now with 18 teams in the Big Ten in 18 different personalities at the athletics director role. It's very interesting. But I will also, I will tell you that no matter how much those athletics directors are all about football and the revenue that they can bring in around football, they're also very much expressing that the reason why they need that revenue is because it's the only way for them to be able to manage the entirety of their athletics program. If we want to maintain broad-based programming, so the Big Ten's very different than the SEC. Although we try to manage relationships with them and, and kind of march forward in a football-centric way, we look very different, the Big Ten, than the SEC in the number of sports that we sponsor, if that's all we're talking about. Um, academically, we look different as well. But um, if we are just talking about the number of sports that we offer, and how is it that Ohio State, let me just use them for example, is 36 sports, can actually maintain 36 sports if they're not concerned about the kind of re revenue they're bringing in around their football program. So do they want to drop 20 programs and look like an SEC school at 16? They could. They could. I don't think they will. They, so not to bring up Ohio State, apologies on that. Mm -hmm. um, but that, but you know, yes, so yes, it's about money. And also it's about individuals trying to figure out how they're going to be able to maintain the entirety. So when I say it's built on a house of cards, it absolutely is. I, I'm not sitting here condoning the kind of salaries that some of our coaches make. Um, I understand that's a free market for them as well. Uh, it's really hard to explain for me how that operates in that way. So understand that I, I hear that as well. And I also know why UCLA and USC decided to make the first move out of the Pac-12 uh, to the Big Ten. Um, because they, they absolutely understood that they had to have the dollars and they were going to find it at the Big <coughs> Ten, and it was likely the only way they were going to be able to maintain their athletics departments, particularly when institutions are putting more and more pressure on them to sustain themselves themselves and not ask for university help to do so. So, yeah. yes, it's about money. <laughs> yeah, but y your house of cards metaphor is really good. This mm -hmm. is the, the business model is unsustainable. And that's what they've discovered. So this is the hunt for revenue and to get yourself in the most strategic financial position you possibly can. And so as I tell my students, follow the money. So you wonder why everybody's moving around? That's the bottom line. Now, I would also say that when it comes to football, um, and I say this, you know, sitting on a panel with a colleague next to me from the Big Ten, a colleague next to her from the SEC, and a colleague who has a degree from an SEC institution, the Big Ten and the SEC are driving all of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they are driving, they are in front of the playoff discussions. They're trying to get a couple more seeds. They're trying to expand to 14 teams. That's, that's so that, well, that's so those two conferences can get more teams in. 
and more revenue. So it's that, it's that constant hunt for revenue. And what I'm concerned about is what happens to the schools that get left out? You're seeing it now. You've got Oregon State and Washington State left of the Pac-12. What happens to them? Well, they're, I don't know. They, they're probably going to have to drop down a level to, you know, a FCS level maybe, or they may have to eliminate some Olympic sports, which I think would be disastrous, or some combination of the two, but they can't compete in this arena if they don't have the protection of one of these major conferences. And I do see a day very quickly where there's going to be two major conferences. Mm -hmm. The Pac-12 is, is dead. The ACC will be next. Clemson and Florida State have sued the conference because they want out and they don't want to have to pay those exit fees and give up some media rights deals. So those two will, will leave. Then what happens to the ACC? And of course, the big domino to fall will be Notre Dame. Yep, and yep. when they end up joining a conference, um, that will be major. That'll be big. So it's not over yet. There's more to come. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's, it's kind of humorous to me now. I mean, the Big Ten is still called the Big Ten, and there's like 30 teams in the Big Ten. Um, Branding. You don't yeah, understand that. Yeah, you can't kill the brand. That's why you don't want to assign a number to something if you're going to change it. <laughs> All right. Um, and, I, you know, I say this as probably the biggest football fan you're ever going to meet. The basketball conferences matter. As, as a, a fan, as a, as a person who likes a lot of sports, the Big East basketball conference, it was really something, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and the, you know, seeing your Big Ten champion and your Pac-12 champion playing the Rose Bowl meant something, okay? And now they're in the same conference. And, you know, wondering while you're watching, you know, college football, hey, who's better? Is it, is it the Big 12 or is it the SEC? Well, let's wait until Alabama and Oklahoma play each other. Well, now they're going to play each other in the regular season because they're in the same damn conference. Okay, it doesn't make any particular sense to me, except, as they said, you're chasing revenue. So eventually you're going to have the Big Ten with 30 teams in it. There's going to be six divisions mm -hmm. that have five teams each in them. Okay, and to act like this is a new thing, it, it's not. We watched TCU years ago get bounced from the college football playoff for Ohio State because Ohio State brings in more crowd and more revenue. They were ranked higher. They should have made the national championship. They got bounced because they weren't Ohio State. And the committee made up rules to make sure Ohio State got in. And when the committee, and I say this as a Bama guy, when the committee wanted to manipulate rules to make sure Alabama got in, they did. Those were probably good manipulations. Uh, <laughs> but overall, this has changed our understanding of college sports forever. I mean, it. you knew when you sat down what teams played in what conference. I can't even tell you who plays in what conference hardly anymore. Somehow the University of Cincinnati is in the Big 12 where they do not belong. Okay? Okay, and as Paul said, we were always used to that traditional independent being Notre Dame. And now their hand is going to get forced. In some form or fashion, Notre Dame's hand is going to get forced. Okay, um, and it is a shame that it came down ultimately to revenue because most of our college sports, the vast majority, are non-revenue generating sports. I mean, golf doesn't make money. It, it doesn't. Most soccer programs aren't going to make money. Most track and field programs don't make revenue. Okay, most college baseball teams don't make any money. 75% of college football programs lose money. 75%. We get blinded by the Alabamas and the Ohio States and things like that that make $100 million a year. A college football program is an extremely expensive undertaking. They have, what, 85 players on a team? 120. But 85 scholarships. 85 scholarships. 85 scholarship players. You get to take however many you want. That's how many hotel rooms. Bus tickets, plane tickets to pay for that, plus the band, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and so the conference realignment has changed our understanding of 
athletic competition in college, as far as I'm concerned, pretty much forever. As the NIL and the, and the uh, transfer portal have altered it significantly as well. Thanks for the interesting sharing and sometimes the disagreement uh, mm -hmm. between our panelists. And I want to leave the last uh, about the 15 minutes for our audience. So if you have any question, you can just ask, please. Hey, um, so regarding the future of uh, like player rights uh, for student athletes uh, moving forward, do you think more schools or teams might um, experience uh, like what happens at um, Dartmouth where their men's basketball team just voted to unionize? in a National Labor, uh, Labor Relations Board sanctioned vote. Do you see that being potentially a future possibility of a lot more programs? My, my colleague has direct experience with mm -hmm. this, and that is a tailor-made question for mm -hmm. you. Yeah, so back in 2016, Northwestern went through this unionization process with our football program, um, and I actually was the department, the representative on the, uh, at the hearing, the NLRB hearing. So I spent five hours on the stand explaining why we don't use our student athletes or we don't think our student athletes, we don't look at them as assets, uh, but rather explaining and expressing all of the things that they receive as a student athlete, benefits as a student athlete, how it's improving their lives and what it is that we're exactly trying to do in our business. Um, essentially, at that time, they decided to not really give a, a ruling Although they believe that student athletes at that time were probably considered more like employees than not, they didn't believe that there was any real opportunity for them to be able to unionize appropriately within just Northwestern or just potentially some private institutions. And so it kind of got left to the side. And it's been hanging out there ever since. But the first kind of attack around, I'll call it an attack, I felt attacked, mm -hmm. attack around um, this and you know um, NLRB decision making was really at Northwestern, and we spent millions of dollars, millions, trying to explain and un and get an individuals to understand how our student athletes are treated, and that we did not believe that it was an employer employee relationship. Fast forward because that seems like decades ago, quite frankly. Fast forward. What's happened at Dartmouth with their NLRB decision is really very frustrating, particularly uh, because I think that the decision was made um, with such broad strokes that right now, if you look at that decision, every high school student athlete should also be considered an employee. The, the, what, the, what they decided was considered to be an employee-employer relationship is so broad. Essentially, you have practice every day. If you don't show up to practice, are you OK? Yeah. OK. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. Um, if you don't show up to practice every day, then is there a consequence? Yeah, you're probably not going to play. You may, have, you may get removed from the team for a week, whatever could possibly happen. There, the, the broad decision around that NLRB decision at Dartmouth said, well, you can't do that. Because if you do that, if there's a consequence for them not going to practice, that's an employee-employer relationship. You're asking them to do something, and there's a consequence to it. And so that turns into this contract. I think it's ludicrous. I think it is ab it's absolutely ridiculous, the decision around at Dartmouth. And I'm also really proud of them for standing up and saying, we're just not going to take this. And we're going to appeal every which way we can to try and get some true clarity around what an employer-employee relationship would look like. My thought around, well, should student athletes be employees? No, absolutely not. But that's because I care so much about the student athlete experience, and I don't think that individuals really understand the consequences that will happen if they become employees. They'll get taxed on everything. They'll need to have their own insurance. So currently, if you look at the student athletes at Northwestern, we, they have, um, we have secondary insurance plans for them. We're not charging them for every physical therapy session that they need to have. So just it, health insurance alone is a massive issue. They would get, they would get taxed on their scholarship dollars and every other thing that comes their way. We could tax them on the nutrition services that we provide to them, the equipment that they receive, all of those things. I don't think that they want that. And I don't think that becoming an employee makes that any better. I also think it blurs the line tremendously around whether or not you are an actual student. Are you an employee? Are you just gonna be employed by the institution? Can you just put on the purple N and decide whether or not you wanna take a class? 
or are you just going to be on the football program? Are you getting paid? So where I think the where student where we need to make the decisions is that there needs to be some revenue sharing occurring, and that student athletes should have the opportunity to receive funds through revenue sharing, but not in an employer employee relationship. I don't think anyone understands exactly what that means. Um, well, I think they're trying to pick and choose the part of it they like yeah. and ignore the parts that you're bringing up that they aren't thinking about. Yeah. Wait till you tell them that they're going to tax their scholarship and see what their reaction is going to be. Or that they can be fired. Yeah, or that they, yeah. They can, yeah, be, they can be fired. Or how about just the simple thing that might resonate with 18, 19, 20-year-olds, which is you'd be then having to manage, you'd have to follow an employee handbook, which also mm -hmm. usually says that you cannot have relationships with students. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, please. Yes. Uh, so obviously, um, you guys talked a lot about the uh, transfer portal. Uh, I know, uh, as we all know, that in 2020, when the whole pandemic happened, the NCAA um, made there be like I believe five, to, five, to, a fifth year or a sixth year for most collegiate athletes. Um, do you think that's like one big thing that the reason so many uh, athletes are transferring is because yes, like say a player goes to like Northwestern or Alabama and they like play the quality of minutes, but um, then that whole thing about NIL comes into play. Do you think that because the NCAA in initiated that fifth and sixth year rule that they try to make the most out of that um, and try to make more of yeah, I, I can see that, and I think that they're, uh, that's kind of, we're almost to the end of that COVID period, thank, thank God. We're almost to the end of that scenario where they kind of got that extra year because they lost a year during COVID. Um, so you have five years to play four years of eligibility. To, so that's where that's, so if anyone's on, not misunderstanding what's going on there, but if one of those years that was a COVID year and you weren't able to play, you kind of got that in, an additional year so you could play the fifth year. And maybe that takes you six years to play five. Um, that, you know, that was, um, uh, that, that could have been a little bit of a part of it. I know at Northwestern, we had some students absolutely enter the transfer portal after they graduated. Um, some graduated in three years and had two years left and thought, I want to go to a grad program. What can I do and how, what does that look like? And they were making those decisions. Um, they were really, it was fine with me. It was so, really sad to see some of them leave. But if I'm really rooted in what I say that I am, which is the academic experience, it makes that you're graduating in three years and you've got two years left and you want to diversify your academic profile by going to another institution for two years and getting a graduate degree there, do it. Go for it. All and I'll help you do it. Um, so I think that's coming to an end. And so you're not going to see as much of a transfer portal issue because of that. Yes, please. Um, you guys have been excellent. It was, it was so good. And I hope my babies have been listening. Um, but I have so many questions. Um, I Just from watching our own season at Richmond this past year, with, we have a kid committed to Rutgers, which is a big deal, which is Peoria. Um, but I love it here. Um, so I noticed as our broadcasting teacher, I'm down the court side doing stuff all the time, capturing images for our broadcasting um, students. And so I've noticed this past year that because we had Lake in Somerville and he um, has stirred up quite a bit and now we have the other, teacher, other players are getting attention, that they've hired their own social media people to be court side as well. Um, and me as a little old lady um, doing videography, I get boxed out a lot because I'm just a little old lady and ladies don't do videography, right? And so that has been frustrating for me, but also eye-opening that they hire their own. So at the collegiate level, what, is, what does that look like? Especially when you have students that are learning videography, but then you have the NIL where they can be in charge of their own image and hire these people. How do you deal with that? Uh, it it takes an awful lot of staff to be able to try and meet the expectations of the student athletes, particularly in the creative content area. I, don't, I won't say that we're um, being super successful with that at the moment, but we do have individuals that have been sort of implanted into some of our more high profile uh, sport programs to be able to do just that, because this is a conversation to what Paul's saying, when individuals want to know what are you going to do to help me with my name image likeness, like that's the conversation mm -hmm. we have. Right. Not what are you going to give me, but what are you going to do to help me? And so we have educational programs that will ex explicitly show them. If you really want to, um, 
uh, manage your name, image, likeness to the degree that you would like. Like, here's how you go about doing it. We have all the tools there for you to be able to do it. And then they'll ask that question. Well, what about the images? Like, I need those images in, in order to be able to help develop my, um, my, um, my brand on social media. So yes, we're trying to generate those opportunities for them as well. Just the, my problem with that is that it doesn't yet trickle down to all of our programs. And everyone deserves that opportunity, no matter how much money they think they're going to be able to make off of it. We should be providing that same, all those images to a fencer, just like we're doing to a football student athlete. So it's a, um, you, and we're in the process right now of trying to reimagine structural changes within our athletics department and what that looks like as far as how many uh, um, staffers you need. Uh, you know, this may, um, I think it's one of the, the, the areas that's growing the most is the content creators. I would say if I was a college coach, administrator, or anything, there's nothing that would concern me more than social media. Mm -hmm. That would be, I think, my primary concern what are they doing with it? How are they running it? Who has access to it? Do they know the things they can and can't post? Or should and shouldn't post? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, representing Yes, because you're not just doing that yourself. You're a representation of. So time out on that, because that creates an employer-employee relationship. Oh boy. And so where before unionization efforts at Northwestern, we would ask our student athletes to be really careful about what they posted and even give them a decision tree to say like here, Think about this, and then this, and this, and this. Before you post, go through this decision tree. Um, we would provide them with and any loads of education around how to manage their social media accounts. We actually specifically do not do that any longer because after unionization, it became clear that that was, an, that was something that we might be doing unintentionally, um, stifling what, how they want to manage themselves or how they want to express themselves. Along with managing themselves, they are, it concerns me when I get 21 year olds are getting millions of dollars. I know that professional sporting industries have, in NBA, the NFL, have run into young athletes coming in millions of dollars. And I am worried that these poor little babies with their not fully developed brains are not making right choices. Do you have something in place at the collegiate level? Is that a part of the NIL, like help you manage that? They also help with money management. Well, it's amazing how I can only imagine how taxing this is on an athletic department. This yeah. is one more thing to regulate, to educate, and at Bradley, we work with those athletes on that mm -hmm. and what the NIL opportunities look like, what you have to be careful of, those kind of things. And now you also we haven't talked about gambling. You have to talk to them about gambling. You have to you have to talk to them about mental health. That's you one thirty poll. Yeah, and there's, <laughs> you only have so many people in an athletic department, and you know maybe that's the reason why it's so hard to get this to all the other sports, right? I mean, you only have so many people, and so I, I feel for athletic departments. They, they, it's one more thing to monitor. I will tell you, professional leagues do rookie symposiums on how to manage money and be responsible, but it generally falls on deaf ears, because the saddest documentary I've ever watched in my life is the ESPN 30 for 30 called Broke and how they lost their money. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if you're a 21, 22 year old and you become an instant millionaire, it's hard for them to understand that the vast majority of their life is gonna be lived where they're not a professional athlete making that money. Mm -hmm. And that you wanna save for a rainy day and there's a lot of days in your life it's gonna rain. Um, and it's actually, it was, that's a hard one to watch. Let's have the last question and I see some questions from this area before. Anyone? Okay, no. John. Yes, please. All right, so like, with the student app, as we transferring from university to university, does it help or hurt the image? Because like, you know, they have fans and stuff at their university. So, does it help or hurt the image? That's a really good question. I don't know that it would help and or hurt. It, I think that's yeah. very specific to the individual uh, and how they decide to manage their leaving and their coming. Um, and if they've got all these, uh, you know, amazing followers that aren't necessarily just loyal to the institution that you're leaving, but loyal to you for however it is that you've decided to brand yourself, mm -hmm. then it probably doesn't hurt you. But I don't know that it's, I, I, I couldn't be able to tell you that if, if it hurts or helps. I think it's very situational. I would say this, that also not being able to answer if it would help or hurt. I know this, that if I was a star quarterback at pick some big top five, you know, power five school, 
I would do what Keenan suggested. I would try to create my own my super team because they know each other. They know people. Some stud receiver at this school, another stud receiver at this school, some stud linemen that go to this school and say, "Hey, transfer here, play one year, we'll go beat everybody's brains in, and then we'll go turn pro." And when they get those teams together, you know what's going to follow them there? NIL money. It's going to follow them there because all of a sudden they're the dominant team. They're the stars. I do think that that is a potential. I, I think that you could run into your, the institution you left to go do that might be bitter, but you're certainly going to find that new fan base at the place where you're showing up to play. You know? And again, that is one difference between college. I mean, most of your pro teams have a limit on how much they can spend, right? Again, we said unintended consequences with some of this, and there's, that's an unintended consequence. Thank you. And if you have any other questions, you are welcome to come to here yeah. after this uh, panel. And everyone, thank you for coming here today. And let's uh, welcome, uh, let's give the applause to our panelists for their presentation. And also, our third panel today will be on uh, one thirty p.m. Still in this room. I will see you again. Thank you. Everyone. Do some lunch.